This is the brand new Lumix GH7 from Panasonic. You're watching Cinity, supported by B&H and CVP. Hey everyone, Grant Miller Sheldon here from CineD.com. I'm on the set, uh, well, I, I'm at Warner Brothers, really. I might as well be on set. I'm usually yeah. you know, normal to be on set here. And I'm at the Panasonic event, standing next to the brand new GH7. So, Sean, what am I looking at here? Yeah, so um, GH7, newest product for the crop sensor line from Panasonic Lumix. Uh, it's one of the probably more exciting ones I think that we've had in uh, quite some time. Uh, it's micro four thirds, 25.2 megapixel sensor, totally redesigned sensor from the GH6, its predecessor, but it is packed with a lot of features that production use case is probably gonna find a much more comfortable home with um, in, in the entire environment. And on top of it, we've also announced the XLR2, a new audio adapter for this camera that enables 32-bit float audio recording directly embedded into the footage, even up to four channels at 96 kilohertz. So, I mean, you know, it's interesting with a camera launch for you know, audio kind of be one of the banner features, but it's about time we had 32-bit float in a nice little adapter like this. The updates came from all the commentary we got with the XLR1. It was great because at least you got high res audio within the camera, you know, higher sample rates, and that's cool and all. But from a usability perspective, it was a bit lacking, right? It didn't have the uh, shotgun holder on it. It didn't have a 3.5 millimeter input on it. So you were stuck with just the two XLRs. So when we kind of took the opportunity, we're like, all right, we're going to make a bigger upgrade to the GH line with RAW and that lovely RE Log C3 now with it too, which we'll talk about in a second. We were like, well, why not do 32-bit? No one else seems to be doing it, so let's us be the first ones to do it. And yeah, four channels, 32-bit float, and you could have the best looking video, but if your audio is meh or subpar, people tend to click off. Very cool. Why don't we like work, you know, in, like start out, work yeah. in. So ergonomics wise, body style wise, has anything changed from the GH6? No, actually. It is the exact same external chassis and we did that on purpose. Knowing that there are a ton of accessories already in existence for it, like this example we've got with a small rig cage on it, Condor Blues cages, you name it, the accessories that exist for the GH6, 100% work on the GH7. And that's what we th felt as very important with the design. Plus, we knew we had thermal headroom with this camera and this chassis. We know what we can deploy with it. So as we start to go through with the active cooling solution, options like the internal raw recording become much easier for us to do, and we don't have to change a workflow that, you know, cinematographers and videographers have already set in when they purchase the GH6. So. Yeah, okay, so working our way uh, inwards, uh, what about, uh, so you said the sensor is new? Yes, so um, despite the fact that it's the same resolution as the GH6, it is a totally redesigned version of those sensors that we're using. So still 25.2 megapixel, but the dynamic range boost function has been fundamentally changed in this setup. Where on the GH6, you were at 2000 as your base ISO and you had to toggle the system on or off. This system runs all the time. So there is no more, do I want to use DR boost? Do I not want to use it? And the benefit there with that is that we can now also, through the hardware changes to it, drop the base ISO to 500 for V-Log. And then we'll talk about it a little more, but the RE-Log C3 unlock, you can go down to 320 with it. Um, so that gives you obviously much better lower noise in shadow regions in the lower ISOs. So you just get better noise performance, but by doing this, we didn't give anything up at the higher end ISO either. So normal convention of thought is, you know, you lower your base ISO, you have to gain up more to get to it. But that's the fun thing about DR boost sensors is that we can actively work on the way the image is being put together through the range so we don't lose anything compared to 2000 ISO. So yeah, it's all benefits here. Better low, low uh, ISO performance, better noise and you're getting the better dynamic range because now you have more usable information in the shadows instead of just buried in noise. Very cool. Well, look, I hope we get to do a uh, Cine D lab test on this soon. I mean, look, you keep touching on it, and it was uh, <laughs> a, a secret spec for a little bit here. Um, Ari Log. How? How did that happen? <laughs> uh, magic. No. <laughs> I will not accept magic as an answer, but please continue. Yes. 
Um, so, so in in the concept of you know making this a a proper cinema tool, not necessarily you know as like an A cam kind of thing, but making sure that our system can can really seamlessly work in with the pro applications of it meant like, okay, let's look at what is the most widely used log profile. Let's find what company that is, which it's a rhetorical question. We all know who that was. And on larger scale cinema productions, sure. Larger sta scale cinema, yeah. yeah. Um, and actually kind of, you know, build it in, start the conversations with them. Their, um, you know, their products, they're well known, you know, Alexa Mini LF, all those things. And they're kind of those next level product for a lot of people that come from the GH line. You know, wh where do I go next? How do I expand my my system to the next level? And by partnering or uh, licensing it from Ari allows us to give users that next step. So for the Ari current users, they now have a camera that they can put in much more challenging situations where you don't want to risk putting, you know, an you know, Alexa. It's easier to put a camera like this and get those POV shots. So it all just kind of worked incredibly well together for us. And yeah, now we've got Ari Log C3 in the GH7. Crash cam has a bit of a negative connotation. You're like, oh, you don't want to spend multiple years building a thing that's a quote crash cam. But look, I mean, the idea, the price point being what it is, and we'll get to that in a second, and being a thing that's safer to, you know, stick on the side of a helicopter pointed down. Exactly, exactly. Those shots where you know that the camera's going to be in much bigger danger. You know, in the higher end cinema side, we saw it in the advent of DSLR and DSLM video capture, right? Being able to put these things into more challenging situations that you either couldn't fit cinema cameras or you wouldn't dare risk the money and the liability on the insurance of that camera. And you want a bit of a quality bump over, uh, say, action cam category. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So building with this, knowing our past that our GH cameras have been used in situations like that for years now. Um, many productions that we use them as like inside car cameras and stuff like that, where your main camera is the other larger cinema options. It just was the right move. And recognizing that this camera on a bigger production scale, yeah, this is the expendable piece of equipment because it's cheaper to buy this than a daily rental of some of those cameras. And if you really want that shot, where you've got the thing maybe mounted to a car that's gonna blow up or get flipped over or any kind of risk of that, do it with a camera like this and know that now with the Ari Log C3 implementation, you're gonna have color matching to those cameras. So you don't have to worry about the colorist getting angry because you used a different camera and a different log workflow. It's all one seamless workflow now. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to test that out specifically. Um, let's go further inside here. So uh, I understand various flavors of ProRes are available. What about resolutions, frames per second? Yeah, so um, for the ProRes options, uh, not much has changed for the basic ProRes options from the GH6. So 5.7K, 4K, or C4K, you've got those options. But now we're deploying ProRes RAW internally. So now we've got uh, ProRes RAW to the CF Express Type B card, as well as use for the external SSDs. Um, obviously, SSDs may be more cost effective per gig um, as we kind of move through, but uh, you now have 5.7K up to 30 frames per second in ProRes RAW HQ, as well as just ProRes RAW. And then you can do a windowed C4K up to 60 frames per second in ProRes RAW, HQ, and ProRes. Now, Re recording at the same time to CF Express and SSD? Uh, no, so it's going to be one or the other. It's either going to be CF Express or you're going to go to the uh, SSD. However, when you're doing RAW, if you're doing the C4K option, you do have the ability to do proxies at the same time, which would go to the SD card that's in the secondary slot on the camera. Uh, when you go to 5.7K, you don't have the proxy options. Um, so usually in a case like that, it's going to be, you're probably not going to work with the proxies anyway. ProRes RAW is a lot easier to work with anyway in many editing software solutions that support it. And then when you start moving further into it with like our MOV codecs, even the, MOV, uh, the MP4 options in the camera, you still have the uh, 5.8K open gate up to 30p. You've got 5.7K full sensor width up to 60p. And then we still do 4K 100 or up to C4K 120 frames per second. That's actually sampled from the full 5.7K width. So the sensor is capable of doing 5.7K 120 frames per second, 
engine processing, bit rates, things like that are why it doesn't do it um, as its own standalone, but that gives us an incredibly sharp looking uh, 4K option for 120p. And you've done some uh, uh, overheating tests in, the, in these situations? Yeah, and with all the Lumix cameras, when we, when we claim unlimited or no time limit recording, it's because we're rating up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit down to negative 10 degrees Celsius. So when we make those statements, it has to be able to do those capabilities at that 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So there are two thermal modes in the camera, just like the GH6 and the S52X and the S52, where you have standard, which is how it ships out of the box. Um, that will get you up to 4K 60p unlimited recording, so you don't have to do anything with it. Once you flip it to high, that's where you can get 4K 120. That's where you can do the open gate options for... Un Great for anamorphic. Exactly. As long as you can power the camera and as long as you can feed it memory, you're able to just keep recording with it. So, yeah. So one of the other banner features, at least for me, is the camera to cloud integration. You want to touch on that? Yes. Um, we are super excited about um, the direct Adobe... Uh, frame IO integration in our cameras. We launched it with the S52 and the 2X. Now we've got it in the GH6, or GH7, wow. Um, it's so new. Yeah, ooh. Um, but what's so awesome about it is that, um, well, for one, if you are an Adobe Creative Cloud user, you've got access to this already. I think a lot of people may not 100% realize that. Um, but even that, if you're just wanting to play with it, you've got access to a free version of it on uh, Frame.io's website. But this gives us that ability to have the proxy files loaded straight up into the cloud. So if you're working on set and you're doing dailies, you can have those things being sent right up and you don't have to necessarily have people on set with you to review the footage. As long as you've got either a Wi-Fi connection or you can do USB to Ethernet on the GH7, to hardwire it and make sure you've got the speed. Um, but even in the photography side, because it still can take really great photos, um, you can still do JPEGs and RAWs there uh, for Frame.io. Um, where I think we separate uh, ourselves with the Frame.io integration is that you also have the ability with those proxy files that you're going to be recording uh, and sending up, you have the ability to have those already LUT applied when they get sent up. So if you're using them more as a kind of dailies op uh, option for getting just quick preview of what's going on on set, or if you're, uh, if you're working with a team that has a social media team that needs quick, fast turnaround with it, you can have the proxy file, which is 1080 up to 60p, already up in the cloud so your social teams can be pulling that content down, getting it out to you know, the social followings, that kind of thing, or you have you know, your video village type set, set up where they're constantly watching, being able to give you feedback, but your internal high res recording is still captured in log or RE log C3. So it really gives you a nice big flexibility with it and you don't even have to do that. You can send the proxies as log as well and they're 10 bit proxies, so. Yeah, I mean everyone's definition of what a proxy file is is different anyway. I mean for like live event stuff, that might be um, you know, all you need. Exactly, exactly. And um, like I said, we're super excited about our um, the, the integration with Adobe. They've been an amazing partner with this, and um, we really believe in what this system means and making things much faster for people to get from camera to delivery, from camera to editors, that kind of thing. Because workflow is really, I think, the next um, frontier for the camera industry. Cameras are becoming incredibly well uh, equipped from a technological standpoint, but not many have worked on the the pre uh, the post production side. So 32 bit audio, proxy recording, the fact that you've got raw internally now, RE log C3, being able to partner with other companies and license from other companies to give you more flexibility in that post side. Um, yeah, it's exciting. You know, one of the things I've always really liked about you guys at Panasonic is just the sense that you play well with others. And I'm getting that with the GH7. You're okay having other partners in the space. You're not throttling things in weird ways with software. And, yeah. you know, my word's not yours, but thank you for playing well <laughs> with others. No, we, we really do take that, that stance that, one, products should be a continual uh, improvement over time, right? Um, I think we've set a pretty good standard with ourselves as far as firmware updates go and what we can build and improve on that. And that comes from the logic of uh, making, a, making the investment that 
you're putting your hard-earned money into worthwhile and longer lasting. And by extension, that means finding other avenues that work better for the creator, the photographer, the videographer, than just locking into a single kind of siloed world. So the licensing from Ari, the partnership with Leica for Leica monochrome in the cameras, um, the Adobe uh, partnership for Frame.io into this, they're all uh, kind of fundamental to what we believe uh, will help grow uh, filmmakers, photographers, videographers. Um, and that's something that we're never gonna change. And all of those things came from the feedback in the community whether it's high-end cinematographers that we talk to or it is the starter photographer that's looking at some of the other cameras. All of that gets taken in and put into the generations of new products that come out. So, yeah. Well, look, you, you brought it up. And speaking of the community, um, any other mount options that you're considering in the future other than Micro Four Thirds? Any other sensor sizes <laughs> that might be, you know, down the line? Let's make some news here. I kind of walked into that kind of question. I mean, you did I? say, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, no. I, you I love just, Micro Four Thirds. You're happy here. Well, it, it's, it's that our system has a lot of synergies that I don't think you necessarily see at face value, right? Micro Four Thirds has a lot of technical advantages over full frame. Faster readout sensors. Typically, we can get faster rolling shutter uh, for rolling shutter sensors. And it lets us really kind of play and work with where we want to push things to the next level. And in the full frame side, as hardware catches up to where the four third sensors are, we can deploy them there. Focus algorithms, all that kind of stuff are the earliest thing we can see. All the new algorithms started on G9 Mark II and then got brought up to full frame. Um, Frame.io launched on full frame and got brought down to micro four thirds. Uh, so we, we really feel that we've got kind of a sweet spot with the two sensors. Um, I know people ask about APS-C sensors and you know Super 35 sensors, but the reality is there's just not enough of a benefit there because when this got put up against a APS-C competitive product, it showed better dynamic range. So why would we do that then? So yeah, we're sticking with micro four thirds and full frame. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you walking me around the brand new GH7 from Panasonic. They're sticking with Micro Four Thirds, and look, I think uh, it, that's justified, honestly. <laughs> Bigger's not always better. I like how compact this is. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you've added a lot of accessories here, yeah, but you know. yeah, very cinema, cinematic. Pro um, rig for where we are. Yeah, pro rig for Warner Brothers. Well, thank you so much for walking me around the brand new camera. Enjoy the rest of the upcoming cine gear. <laughs> it's happening soon. And yeah, you know, sunscreen, lots of water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks so much for watching our quick look at the Panasonic GH7. Brand new here at the WB lot. Thanks for watching, everybody. Yeah.